Customs Agency inspiring. The spirit of giving love to connect with you. Here's the numbers 021 442 from Cape Town, from Johannesburg 011 Right, we have this feature called Champion People. Why? Because quite simply, Champion People build champion nations wherever they may be in the world. Well, today we have a person born in Egypt, living in the UK, so I understand. Uh, and uh, But there's much more to him than just that, okay? Dr. Hani Albana is with us. Uh, thank you for your time. And great to have you, well, in your company in this case, two successive days. So I'm pretty honored. Thank you. And assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Thank you. Now, I'm looking at the things you do, right? Um, chairperson of the Muslim Charities Forum, uh, president of the Humanitarian Forum, uh, founder, co-founder of, of Islamic Relief, and that's Islamic Relief Worldwide. Uh, am I missing out in other things as well? Because I think there's like 10 other things, but amongst the key things? I think that's enough. I think let's focus on the discussion of today about the charity work, about the humanitarian response, about the need for us to respond heavily to what's happening in the world. Mm. Why, why are you here in South Africa, in Ramadan? I came to South Africa in Ramadan to visit the stricken area in Malawi and Mozambique about uh, the cyclone, the rest of the cyclone, the season, and to learn a lot from the needs of the people, to learn it from the small organization in South Africa and Malawi and Mozambique, and to have a new vision of how to go forward, uh, especially in Africa, of having big uh, hit by a cyclone like this affecting uh, very poor areas and unusually so because it, it's not common right yes and the twice in one month or two months mm -hmm. in, in mozambique as well that's why i'm here to learn more than actually to give something out okay and have you been to those areas or you still tomorrow going? tomorrow i'm going to malawi and next week i'm going to mozambique inshallah okay T tell me therefore I mean, and, and when you say you want to learn would that be part of the muslim charities forum on, on behalf of them or Oh. It's uh, Muslim Chats Forum is an umbrella of Muslim Chats in UK, about 17 organizations, being built 11 years ago to try to coordinate and to collaborate between the organization, to create big partnership between both of them, and increase the capacity of the local small organization in UK. The second organization called the Humanitarian Forum, which is a bridge between international organizations globally, when you bring people together in one platform to empower especially the small grown organization mm. from the south, especially, this is the second organization. So I'm here on behalf of both of them, plus on personal capacity, I want to learn. Because the more you learn, the more you'll be able to deliver a message, the more you'll be able to find a solution, the more you'll be able to motivate different community in different parts of the world. So what, what, what's the great insight there for in advance? Uh, when it comes to relief organizations, uh, humanitarian organizations like the ones you're involved in, being able to provide support to, you know, drought-stricken areas, uh, cyclone-stricken areas, flooding, earthquakes, whatever. And is, is there a key formula that says, this is the way we do it that will work? You see, the most important thing you can take away from this response is a smile on the face of a child or a handshake mm -hmm. from an old man or uh, a nodding from a head of the old woman who's telling you thank you. It's very important to be with the people at the time they need you, not at the time you need them. So it's very important to stand next to them and this is what makes the difference. What makes the difference is to be there, to be available, to be listening, to be amongst them so uh, this is what makes the difference between you and somebody else who's going there to take some photograph mm -hmm. or going to, to just write a report. Because humanitarian work is a mission, is not just a job. A job is a part of the mission. Humanitarian work is a message to be delivered not only to the poor people who are the owner of the money that you spend on them, but really a message to humanity. And the message, which is the part of the message of Islam. So Islam is a universal message where the Prophet ﷺ was talking to everyone, anyone, everywhere, anywhere. Even talking about animals, birds, habitats, climate, and all these sort of things. And humanitarian work is a part of Islam as a message. It's a part of Islam as a mission. 
is a part of Islam as a product that you have to deliver to the community that you claim that you are serving. Mm-hmm. This is the dimension of the Amitian work that we would like to let the young people before coming to this field of work to understand the dimension and the mechanics of such a dimension which can build their character before coming and after the coming. Okay. Somebody, somebody listening in may be saying, I think I know what charity is, but, but what is humanitarian work? So, so what's the one-line description humanitarian of Humanitarian work, of what as is defined by the, by the West, is a relief response. So to stand next to the people at the time of disaster. When the disaster is over, you go to rehabilitation and you go to development mm-hmm. and you go to a long-term program. Humanitarian work is the quickest response to the people in need at the time of need where they are. Mm-hmm. Like if in tsunami, I remember it was happening, I can't remember, 24th or 25th. The Last first, Christmas Day, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Boxing Day. Yeah. Day and yeah. actually the first team from uh, Indonesia in Banda Aceh was there on 26th. We were there on 28, 29, traveling from UK to go to Banda Aceh at that time. This world, people want to see you. A material response, a part of it is the human feeling in your heart towards them when they are in a state of shock. If they are in a state of shock and they are sad, they even say, shaking the hand without having anything mm-hmm. to give, this is a feeling to lift them up. You made the point earlier that, that the the results of humanitarian work is exactly that, the girl smiling or the old man coming That's it. to shake well, your hands. Yeah. I, I take it uh, yourself, Dr. Hani Albana, you, you've encountered that on many occasions, the little girl smiling and the man hugging you and embracing yes. you. Yeah? Yeah, that, that's actually, when, when, when we go to different parts of the world and we don't know even to speak the language, we can speak the animal language, we can make some songs to them, to let them what, what you need to be, to be doing as a humanitarian worker is to draw a smile in the hearts, not on the face of the people. When people smile from their hearts, their body will be feeling the power that they can go forward in their agony, in their, in, in, in their struggle, in their difficult life. So here is the challenge. And if your communication with them go through your heart, it will go to their heart to draw an, a, a never-ending smile on their faces because it comes from their hearts. Mm. And this is where the people who don't understand your language, the people who don't understand your culture, the people who don't understand you, their hearts is open for you because they trust your mission. Because your mission is for them, not for yourself. And, and do you find, therefore, that in just about all cases with these responses that you make, that these communities or countries affected by it, there's a sense of utter hopelessness or, or helplessness, or in fact, is it helpless, but there is hope? It's helpless, and some, some, sometimes they lost hope. You know why? Because they lost everything. Like when you look now at the last influx of displaced people from Idlib and Syria, mm. three, four hundred thousand came out after the bombing. They are sitting under the trees, have nothing with them, apart from what they carried with them when they left home. This moment is the moment of helplessness. Losing hope is the moment when you have to be there with them. Even if you don't have anything in your hand, but being there makes life different for them and change the state of hopelessness into being hopeful. Well, I, fight back. I certainly want to find out later on how, how did you get involved in that in the first place. My guest in the Champion People feature is Dr. Hani El Banna. Uh, he is, uh, well, amongst many titles, chairperson, Muslim Charities Forum, uh, UK-based, that is, uh, and then also president of the executive of the, of the trust, that is, of the Humanitarian Forum, as well as a co-founder of Islamic Relief, which I think would be certainly well known to you uh, because it's, it's, it's a... It's an organization that you should be familiar with. Lots to engage with. By the way, if you want to call in and engage, not me, but engage him, well, here's your chance. Otherwise, the opportunity will go away. So here's the numbers to call in. 11 if you're doing it through Johannesburg. Through Cape Town, it's 21 442 uh, Voice notes are welcome. It's 83 You can also listen in on uh, Facebook Live 
on Salah Media as Instagram Live as well. If you want to listen by an app besides online, just go to tune in and you'll find us there. Lots to talk about there. So, interestingly enough, you made the point that it's providing a relief response. It's always a response, right? Yeah. Humanitarian work is not proactive. I mean, there are people in other parts of the world in this country that do proactive nation building, community building. That's not humanitarian work. This comes, you can do it while you are doing humanitarian response in an area which is settled, okay, or you can do it sooner after the humanitarian response is over, mm -hmm. when you can build a community. There's different mechanics between humanitarian response and community building. Community building is a long-term program, not projects, because quite often mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. think that they've done a project of development. Pro development is a program. Program made out of different projects, water, sanitation, Absolutely. health, and all this collectiveness. If we go to a village and we're saying that we need to develop this village over the coming 10 years, okay? So what do we need? We need schooling, we need a local market, we need a community center, we need sanitation, we need uh, a clinic, we need uh, uh, schools and all these kinds of things. So collectively, over the coming five or ten years, you make a program of development or development program to change the whole area, actually, by providing water, sanitation, all the, and this is the development program. Inside the program itself, there's many projects you can do. Mm. Project is not just something, somebody jump on the bandwagon mm, mm, and go and take a photograph and said, hey, we've got 10,000 exactly. projects. Each project lasts for six months or one month or two months. This is a joke. This is a joke. Who actually, sometimes, sometimes infest the humanitarian work and the development work and the advocacy. What we need nowadays, uh, Brother Ashraf, is not only development. We need to talk about advocacy, we need to talk about research, we need to talk about think tank, we need to talk about building youth leadership, we need to talk about building local community and empowering the local community and making them to be a part of the international Absolutely. community. I think all these are important. Well, what do you say to the critics that say, if there's a problem in, in South Africa, Allah forbid, yeah. if there's a problem in Mozambique, which is very much our neighbor, or Botswana, or... or, or uh, uh, Malawi or wherever it may be in the world, Haiti, uh, Indonesia, wherever. Really, we have enough problems of our own. Let those countries sort it out themselves. But what do you say to someone who tells you that? What will happen when it comes to you at home and people don't help you? It's the same. My duty as a humanitarian worker is to be responsive than responsible. Mm -hmm. Responsible for whatever I can. I don't say that I'm going to solve the, the Mozambique problem. But I can do my share. Because Allah says that, Allah is asking you to do what you can. As I said earlier, even being with the people there, even with sending a message. But, but is it fair to say that in many, not one or two, I'm saying in maybe 40, 50 countries of the world, when there's a major disaster, those countries will not be able to cope if they don't get Definitely. Them, if they don't get support. Definitely. 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 That's why what I need and not what, what we need is to build coalition. And instead of each organization go for a budget of 20 or 50 or 100,000 dollars each, mm. if we sit down together and we plan ahead, that actually when a, a problem happened in this area, maybe the first team from the collective of the organization have the first 100,000 dollars, but by the end of four, the first or second or third week, we could spend the million or the two million, the three million. When our community feels that we are united, they give more money. They give more money to the collective because they feel that unity is the answer for, for actually responding mm -hmm. to the different big disasters, whether in Syria or... Nobody can claim that they can do the work for Yemen. In one village in Yemen, in one village in Syria, in one village in South Sudan, in one village in the Democratic Republic yeah, of Congo, yeah, yeah. in one village in Africa, uh, Central Africa. You know, in Central African Republic, as we were discussing it earlier, there's ethnic cleansing on a daily basis. A few hundred thousand Muslims have already left to Chad and the other countries. Why? Because of this ethnic cleansing. And nobody's talking about it. We need to talk about it. Absolutely. Is your, is your efforts, uh, specifically Dr. Dr. Albana, uh, is it Muslim orientated? No, I, no, I understand no. the inspiration, but, yeah. but do you go to Muslim places? No, uh, no. You mentioned the DRC, which is not, I know. Right? Yeah. No, not at all, actually. You see, because Islam is not for the Muslims. Islam is for humanity. 
Islam as a universal message taught us to look after our next door neighbor, even to the fifth or the sixth or the sixties a neighbor next to us without saying, Prophet ﷺ without saying whether he is a Muslim or not a Muslim. When there is a need, there is no distinction. There is no distinction whatsoever. And you, in practical terms, you play that out. I believe in it. If I, if, 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 even if I don't have the means, I believe in it. So I understand for Allah telling him, you created those people, and this is my responsibility as a Muslim. If I don't have the means, but I have the message. That actually when we do work for humanity, we have to remove all the barriers, to cross all the borders, because the need is for the needy. And the needy, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ma'un, Allah said in this surah, if you look at the scale, one side and one side, those people who do not treat orphan without mentioning is the orphan Muslim or Muslim, or treat them badly, are like the people who deny the religion. The day of judgment. Okay, it's not only yeah. those people who do not advocate for the needs of the needy are like the people who deny the, 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 the day of judgment. He never said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, this is the needy Muslims or this is the, the Muslim yatim. This very heavy weight, universal message to all of us who have to cross all the borders to reach the needy because the Prophet, وسلم, when he said, Oh Allah, Make me among the miskin. He never said Muslim miskin or non-Muslim miskin. That among the miskin, as a whole. Yeah. How? Let, let's take with the organizations that that you involved in. I mean, how much? First of all, is are our organizations in competition with each other? Because you know, you it speak about it, coming together. So they do good. Everybody does good. But yeah. but are they competing to be the best and better than the other? And, and they're in their own little league, if I can call it that. There's no harm of competing. Mm -hmm. But was, when you compete, you can coordinate as well. Your market share could be 50%. My market share could be 5%. But one day, I might have the most innovative idea, which can give me the 50% to what you have. So at the end of the day, if you want to become bigger and to grow bigger, you have to allow the smaller organization to grow as well, to let them to stand next to yourself. And fatherhood in the, in, in, this, in the humanitarian sector must be there when the big organization mm. takes the small organization by the hand, not to cut their throat. This is very, very important. That's why coordination meeting, collaboration meeting is very important. So how, you, how successful have you been? I, mean, you, you, I, I know you, you, you're a prime founder of, um, of Islamic Relief, but I mean, that's not your, your beat at the moment, right? Yes. You spend most of your time uh, with, the, with the other forums. So, with the Muslim Charities Forum in the UK, for example, are you successful in getting them to understand exactly what you just said? We are partially successful. Successful. I have to be very honest. Because changing the mindset is more difficult than actually planting a tree, mm. than actually building a road or building a building. Working in the mind and in the heart takes years. But alhamdulillah, it is, it is being taken seriously by a lot of organizations. We have 17 of them now in Muslim Child's Forum, but we need them to become 70 or 80 or 90 or 100. There's a lot of hard work. Other thing is actually Muslim donors or even non-Muslim donors do not give money to this kind of activities. They can give you money for disasters, mm -hmm. for a cyclone, for flood, for uh, victims of uh, conflict and all sorts of, but when it comes to them workshop, what comes to them, capacity building, what comes to them, <laughs> research and advocacy. Oh, what is this? Why, why not? Do they not get it? This is the level of awareness, which actually we need to raise the donors to have it. To be very honest, Allah said in the Surah Ma'un, Had, the word the Had is absolute advocacy. Okay. Well, well, Allah, absolute advocacy. And now we don't invest in advocacy. Yeah, well, there you are. Lots of important insights coming out. This is my guest, Dr. Hani Al-Banna, born in, in, in Egypt, living in the UK, I understand. Uh, but uh, it also has got an OBE. I'll find out why did he get that OBE in a moment. O double one six H O O three double five uh from uh, Joe Mix, so our media listeners. Otherwise, O two one double four two three five three zero if you wish to connect with us via Voice of the K. But otherwise, I know many people watching us on Facebook Live as well. So thumbs up to you for watching and you can actually comment right away even when we're there. I want to find out, in fact, where did it all start for a person who in fact is a medical doctor. We'll get to that in a moment. Millions of people are living in terror and shelter. Alright, so we, we, we off air 
on the one hand, we'll be live here. This is the, the remarkable thing, okay? And just for all of you, we are in a studio uh, in Johannesburg in South Africa called Salam Media, which I think appropriately is called Peace, right? So it's trying to maintain a peace amongst humanity wherever we are in the world. And, and uh, we're going to connect with you as well based upon uh, this. Uh, you can post comments below this particular posting and we will pick it up as well. And, and I certainly think I'm going to read it and I will certainly comment as as well. And uh, you can add comments as well and connect with us uh, too. Okay? So there we are, very important. And, and what happens when you have a break, as we're having now, there's often a behind-the-scenes chat with the presenter and the guest. So this is like uh, what I call the backstory. What happens when very few people see you in a privileged position, even more important than listening to a radio. There we are. Yeah. So we had, we had a good meal last night. We can tell them that, that we, we sat. Uh, Ponte, you can't see the station managers out of picture. We sat till midnight last night. Wow. Or wow. thereabouts. Wow. Uh, so we had a very good... Very interesting chat with oh, that's uh, nice. that's great. with uh, Dr. Honey together with uh, Honey Albana together with uh, Kari Zia as well. So appreciate that. Um, yeah, yeah, that yeah. You're here with us as well. Absolutely. How do you imagine? How do you uh, cope with the traveling aspect? Because would you travel a lot? I I sleep on the plane. On the plane. Oh, it's like me. I always oh, sleep. Okay, sleep on the plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is this is good. Uh, this is what uh, South Africans, Muslim, um, our charity organization should adopt. You know, this fact that uh, all the NGOs coming together mm. and to form a forum. That's right. Yeah. We, we can transfer the knowledge to you. We, we need to aspire to, 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 you know, to get to that level. Yeah. 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 It's something we, can, yeah. we should pick up yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She's buying time. She's buying time. Is it? Yeah, she's, she's trying to to get mm -hmm. those guys. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Patch up with two different radio stations. Um, one is Voice of the Cape, so when they're playing adverts, we, we then have to match up with them. That's why sometimes it takes longer. Mm. So you see, you guys getting a. When are you coming to South Africa? That's what we want to know to all of you, okay? Uh, let let me give him a message about South Africa. Well, we'll yeah. do that just now. Yeah. It's going nice. Talking to Dr. Hani Albana, Salaamu Alaikum. Great that you engaging with us as a, as a listener or a viewer. And you can watch us uh, via Salaam Media, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, uh, as well as Voice of the Cape directly on radio. If you're listening, thumbs up. Glad that you're doing just that as well. Uh, and also via the uh, App that is on from Salam Media, which go to the Tune In app and you find us 0116 Johannesburg, Cape Town 021 442 and the WhatsApp voice note 083 709 2083. Now, I made the point you're doing impressive work. Uh, you're a medical doctor. I was. Goodness, like nobody gives it up. So, so do you actually say I was? Like you, I do, I do, I was. All right, you better tell us the story. So what happened to you from the beginning? Because I understand there's a fascinating story between your choice of career, between your views, your, your mother's view and your father's view. What happened? How did? <laughs> <laughs> My father wants me to be a sheikh, alim, because right. he was alim, rahmatullahi And my mother wants me to be a doctor, a medical doctor. So I went through my mother's tunnel. Of course, every child go follow the mother, not follow the father. So I came to UK uh, to do my medical degree. Alhamdulillah. From, I, from Egypt, right? Yeah. From Egypt. Yeah. From, I'm qualified from Azhar University Medical right. School. And I never thought that we'll do Islamic career. We'll start Islamic career. My objective was to have a degree and go back to Egypt 
open clinic and this is the end of the story but I feel that Allah gave me my degree which is doctor of medicine MD because of Islamic belief so it was a crossroad between education career medical career and humanitarian response 1983 was the turning point with the, with the with the famine in Eritrea and Tigray, mm. with the part of Ethiopia at that okay, time, on of, on of Africa, yeah. and at that time we found that Muslims in the country doing nothing in in, in those regions, in, predominantly in, Muslim regions, right? especially in UK. Okay. All the response for the non-Muslims. That's why the idea came after visiting Sudan and seeing some of the refugees to do something. So why, why did you visit? Because I mean, you, you're the medical doctor. Yeah, you went the, on, a, on a medical? There was a medical meeting there okay. and they went right. to attend it. And at the same time, one of the uh, people working in, in an organization there took us by the hand and we saw this kind of... We started very, in a very humble and simple. Very simple. But wait, that, that visit then from Sudan, Eritrea, that changed your life in effect? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I went back to my family in... Uh, um, uh, end of Christmas, beginning of, uh, I think, uh, the January, 1st or 2nd of January, 1984, to show my family, my mother, my relatives, the images. And there is about 1,500 Egyptian pounds with 20 pence from a young boy at the age of nine. What is, this was his chocolate money. This was the first donation to start mm. at the first seat mm. for Islamic Youth. Then from there, we'll make some khutbah in Islamic University, in Islamic in Islamic society in the yeah, uh, Islamic society in Birmingham University and Aspen University and we raised about another maybe few hundred pounds. We opened a bank account. That's it. And then we went from door to door. Driven, driven by what? The need. That driven by the needs. Something. Driven by the needs. The only thing at that time we're focusing on the needs of the people who came out. Okay, but let me ask you this then before we, we continue. So, you're a medical doctor. I know what your mother and father said. Fine. But you go to Sudan and you go to visiting the neighbors and you see what happened in Eritrea and, and you're obviously shocked by that, I understand, right? Yeah. But, but shock is one thing. Yeah. How does that translate into effectively moving on a completely new journey to take action? What, this is, what provoked that? What provoked that is the images and the enormity of the problem which led you to feel that you are responsible for anyone and every one of those people, even if you don't have any money. And this is where you find most of the prophets, all the prophets have got this kind of responsibility which we cannot measure. And we cannot actually draw the dimension of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's so heavy when you see skinny people, skinny people and dying people in agony. And he say, what I'm doing? And this shift you. Once you shift one angle to one, actually five degree or 10 degree, it will keep you, it will take you to the right direction. This is what happened exactly. The, the, the very, very strong images came out from the refugees camp at the time. Make this shift My, okay. in the mindset. So it, changed, it changed you. Definitely. Right? Yeah. Okay, then you decided with you and who? With me, as, as, uh, when I came uh, to the UK, it was a, 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 a Iraqi Palestinian brother, Dr. Ahsan, was doing his PhD in chemistry. Mm -hmm. And he said, Yes, I'll be with you. Only two people, no okay. office. No plan, no budget, no facilities, no VIP, nothing. And we were going from door to door, from shop to shop, from mosque to mosque, from street to street, from function to function, mm. to raise funds for Africa. And with these donation boxes at that time. Every Tuesday, or no, every th uh, Saturday, we used to go and open the donation box. Mm -hmm. The first headquarter of the organization was a donation box, costing us 16 pounds at that time. We opened, used to open it every Saturday and take the checks, five pound, ten pound. In August 1984 was the, the, the biggest donation which came to us, which was 1,000 pound from a, 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 a doctor, originally from Libya, I was working in UK, to the people in Africa. And we made a party of all oh, mm. 1,000 pounds, right, Akbir. And you say, and this made us made, made our journey after eight months of hard work of walking from door to door. You see, this is very important. Never put the resources as a challenge. You or challenge the, or the lack of resources. The lack, sorry, yeah. sorry, the lack mm -hmm. of resources as a challenge. Mm -hmm. the, your challenge is to make resources. Your challenge 
is to drive your vision. Your challenge is to make to translate your vision into a product, a tangible product that the community can follow you. Your challenge is not to follow the flow as a leader, but to make the people to follow the flow you make for them. This did you always challenge. did you always feel that way? You know, never let the lack of resources yeah. limit your your goals. No, I never because I left a multi-million pound organization to a 200,000 pound organization and it's still 200,000 pounds and I cannot raise the 200,000 pounds yeah. and do struggle to raise them. You see, this is the challenge. For 11 years, the budget is about 150, 200,000 pounds. We struggle to raise it, but because there's a need, sometimes the community might not see what you see, Brother Ashraf, but mm. because of the need to start, to keep planting this tree, our 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 aim is to change the tree into a forest. So you made the point that, or I understand the claim that uh, Islamic Relief. So that's the organization that you founded, right, with your with your Iraqi uh, Palestinian colleague. Uh, then grew into what the, the largest uh, Islamic humanitarian organization in the world or in the Western world? In the world, bigger than anyone in the Middle East. How, how big? Could be three hundred to be up to three hundred million dollars, and 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 based in how many countries? More than forty countries. Wow! How did that happen? Is what we're going to find out right after this. Right. So we're still on. Uh, I understand you watching us live. Let me tell you. So my name is Ashraf Garda. I'm from South Africa, Johannesburg, the biggest city in South Africa. Uh, I'm a I'm a talk show host, radio presenter, TV presenter. I also am the chief driver of a movement called Champion South Africa. We have a goal. We want to move South Africa from a mid-table nation to a champion nation. You know, in football terms, if you perform poorly, you get relegated. If you do well, you win the league championship. So we want to win the league championship. We want to be a nation that is an example that can aid other nations. We have many problems. We need capacity. We need the drive. We need the will. Uh, a phrase I use often is champion people build champion nations because in effect champion people build champion people okay uh, my guest my honored guest is one of those champion people they capacitate other people okay uh, but about south africa it's unique three percent muslim population uh, there are many egyptians who've come to south africa uh, and, and from other parts of the world north africa somalians as well uh, since democracy since apartheid ended uh, south africa has an incredibly high level of religious tolerance and religious freedom. You can pray where you, where you want, you will get, you can, everybody in non-Muslim spaces gets off for Juma. you get off home early in Ramadan, you want to wear a scarf, you want to wear hijab, you want to wear niqab, you wear it, you can be a university lecturer, nobody will tell you anything. In fact, if they do, you will take them to human rights court and you will win that, and people have done that. Uh, it is one of the great features of South African life when the president of the country is appointed, as he will be soon, I can assure you a Muslim and a Hindu and a Jewish person will be present in this country of 80% Christians. It is a hallmark of one of the great things of South Africa. Um, and we, as Muslims, I think, are and we should be very grateful. Would love it if you pay us a visit soon, inshallah. And that's true, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Mm. We've got five minutes left, hey. incredibly. Five this, minutes. This so hour, eh? Yeah. <laughs> we needed one hour. Yeah. Or two. Clean. My, my guest, Dr. Haniel Banna, we've got five minutes uh, more with him, chairperson of the Muslim uh, Charities Forum and also president of the Humanitarian Forum. I wish I could ask him so many more things about things in Egypt and, and the Middle East. We'll see if we can get there in the, in the remaining minute. Uh, the question I want to ask you, so you mentioned some numbers. Just repeat that number again in terms of uh, the Islamic uh, relief. Just what budget did that hold? It could be up to 300. 300 million, million. US dollars? US wow, million. okay, US dollars. How did the capacity grow from the two medical people walking uh, on the high street in London uh, with your little box to where it is now? What, 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 what's the lesson? How did that happen? We were focusing at that time in the 80s on the rich countries to start the fundraising offices first, such as America, such as Sweden, such as Germany, France, uh, Italy, UK and the others. Mm -hmm. 
This will stabilize your income. We did not rely on non-European or non-American countries at the very beginning, at that time. Mm -hmm. After that, we start to grow يعني, slowly in the south, like Sudan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and all the other problems. But when we made the balance between the two, actually mm -hmm. we managed to mm -hmm. raise the fund through the rich communities in different parts of, of the rich countries as that I mentioned. This is what made us mm -hmm. and what made Islamic League actually to be successful up till now. We were created at the time when the political atmosphere was not as bad as it was we see nowadays. The division among the Muslims was not as bad as we can see nowadays. The Islamophobia and the counter extremism mm -hmm. and counter terrorism were not as bad as we, 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 we are seeing nowadays. But we managed to succeed it excellently at the time of September 11th, when we decided uh, uh, courageously not to put our head down, but to stand up and to defend the community globally and say, hey, we are, we are not going to shy from the media. We're going to go to the media, to talk to the media, to head back to the media and to show them the distinction between us as a humanitarian organization and the people who dip their, their, their head down. And that worked. And it did work very well. So at a time of disaster, you have to be clear and clean and vocal, actually, and melding this kind of uh, partnership and coalition between others. The good thing about was our success is, or was, we opened our gates 10 years before September the 11th. Then when, wow. when September the 11th came, everybody knew us from the United Nations, mm. from the European mm. Union, from the politicians and others. So, they, they cannot raise their eyebrows about us. What's your, what's your message to, to, we've got two minutes to go, I'm afraid. What's your message to South Africa in terms of people listening, involved in humanitarian efforts in, in capacity building? We have to invest in our country in South Africa. Build the capacity of the organization, build the capacity of our youth, connect with the, with the greater non-Muslim community and society, show them the beauty of our culture, the beauty of our religion, the beauty of our values. Don't live in ghettos anymore. No ghettos anymore. Mm -hmm. Ghettos will make us live in a suicidal area or in an area that anybody can come and remove us or alienate us from, from, from the country. It's a time that we will have to invest in women, in youth, in community building, and bridge building with other organizations in and, our and country. quickly, how, how, in 30 seconds, how... How significant is Muslim relief, not Islamic, Muslim relief amongst all the Muslim organizations uh, when it comes to relief work in the world compared to, to those who are not Muslim? They could be the first, but nobody will know about them. Why? Because they don't use media. They actually shy from using media, shy from communicating and connecting, shy from coming to the international community and being a part of United Nations, a part of European Union, a part of all these big established. We have to know the art, how to connect and be a part of the different... Right, here's the last thing. What about giving charity with your, with your one hand and, and covering it with the it's other? It's your own personal money, not my organization money. My organization money has to be public and everybody should know it. And I should be accountable to every penny that I spend, whether actually I spend it rightly or wrongly. Because I'm accountable to community accountable to government, accountable to donor, accountable also to the poor people that I claim that I'm their champion. Of course, I will say he got an OBE for his work with the Islamic League. So here's the last thing as we get to news. I made the point about moving South Africa from a mid-table nation to a, to a champion nation, champion South Africa. What's the one thing we need to do as a country to get there? Invest in human resources. Invest in youth. Invest in technology and education. Education is the cornerstone of advancement of any country on earth. Not the traditional education, the education with the contemporary education in different aspects of life. Absolutely. That's where we're going to leave it. Good chatting to you. I will chat to you wherever you are in the world because there's many other things I want to pick your brain on, but not today. Certainly one of our champion people in the world, I would say, Dr. Hani uh, Albana, the chairperson of the Muslim Charities Forum, founder of Islamic Relief, Thank you for honoring us with your visit. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Let's get the news now and we join Voice of the Cape.